this meeting um, um, hello we're trying to start the talk can you whisper <laughs> <laughs> you have to whisper from now on so um, so the, the, what Tony has been doing in his lab and in that sense I think they take a very special role in the field and they have done uh, an amazing amount of work um, Tony has been pushing a very systematic agenda in sort of translating this understanding this detailed understanding of biological systems, um, in particular systems for touch, um, the whisking system, into pretty detailed models that then are applied to robots, but not just any robot. So if he doesn't just take a feedback or something, these are really purpose-built purpose -built machines that try to capture these morphological features of biological systems that seem very critical to the functions that Tony tries to understand. So in that sense, I think there's some really important messages in this work. Uh, it's great that Tony uh, is going to talk to us this morning to divulge all this deep insight in how biology realizes touch. Tony. Thank you very much. Okay, so um, I just wanted to explain uh, this logo. So um, we, we're from the Active Touch Laboratory, which is based in the Department of Psychology in Sheffield, but we recently formed something called the Sheffield Centre for Robotics, abbreviated to Centro. So. <laughs> so within uh, psychology, um, can we put this, some of the lights down? Because there's going to be lots of movies. Yeah, the blackboard light. That's better. That's good. So within our um, department, we really have two, well, there are three groups working on biomimetics that I mentioned here too. One is uh, uh, my group, which works on active touch sensing, and the other is Kevin Gurney's group, which uh, works on active vision. And we both take this approach of trying to reverse engineer biological systems in order to develop artificial systems. And what we're doing, I think, is taking the two major systems that are studied in mammalian neurobiology, the varicel system of the rat and uh, the visual system of primates, in including humans, and the idea is to, if we can really understand sensory motor control in these two systems, then we're a, a long way towards understanding the brain and building some useful brain-like systems that could control robots. So before I get started, I wanted to thank the people that have done uh, this work. Um, particularly uh, Ben Mitchinson uh, has done a lot of the uh, animal work that I'm going to talk about and the robotics. Uh, Nathan Laporo is here, um, has done... Uh, quite a lot of the work on pattern recognition and is here to uh, help with the sort of biomimetics roadmap work that we're doing this week. And then uh, various other people, uh, Swiss mentioning Stuart, uh, who's been doing the work on the barrel cortex, uh, which is the most recent, and I'll come to towards the end. And the, the robotics is done in collaboration with Bristol Robotics Lab. In particular, Martin Pearson has built many of the robotics platform and worked very closely in Mitch and getting them to do cool stuff. So the theme of our uh, research is active sensing, active touch sensing, but I like to start with uh, an explanation of what I mean by active sensing from the domain of vision and from a fantastic sport that we play in, in cricket and many other parts of the world, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, it's like baseball if you're American, but uh, more complicated, there's more rules and it goes on for five days rather than for two hours, and after five days, nobody might win. So, uh, but you can get a really exciting and gripping draw. Goes down to the rat bowl. So... Uh, and you actually like it. <laughs> I love it, and uh, psychologists like it, because uh, uh, Michael Land spent a long time studying the behavior of the batsman to see what he was doing. So this guy, the bowler, is throwing the ball really as fast as he can, sort of... Uh, 90, 100, 120 kilometers per hour, and uh, his aim is to knock over these bits of, bits of wood called the stumps. Or if he can't do that, he wants the batsman to hit the ball in the air so it can be caught. So the batsman is aiming to see where the ball is going and to strike it uh, as well as he can out towards the boundary. So the question is, where does the batsman look? And if you're coaching people to play cricket, then it, the coach standard, the standard line in, in coaching is to say, keep your eye on the ball and watch where the ball is going. Uh, in fact, that's not what expert batsmen do, although 
as a coaching rule, it probably works. But uh, when you study the eye movements of these guys, what they do is they keep their eye on the ball while the bowler is running up. They see how he's holding the ball. Uh, they see what's happening to the ball as he's raising his arm. And they watch him for the, a few uh, milliseconds after the ball has left his hand. And in that time, they seem to be computing the trajectory of the ball. And then they saccade to a spot on the ground here where absolutely nothing is happening. This is just a, a patch of dirt and dust, a few blades of grass. What's interesting about this bit of gra uh, ground is that this is where the ball is projected to land. And by fixating there in advance of the ball landing, he has the best chance then of calculating the trajectory of the ball when it comes off the ground and then he can hit it with the bat. So the, the idea of active sensing then is not that you necessarily look at the most salient thing in the world, the thing that's moving around or is brightly colored. You're looking at the place in the world where you can get the most information. And from moment to moment, you may be calculating in fairly, some fairly efficient way where is the best place to look next, look next to get that information. So this idea of active sensing as being uh, purposeful and information-seeking control of the sensor apparatus is really quite an old one. Uh, James J. Gibson, very famous psychologist, proposed this in relation to the sense of touch. He said when one explores anything with the hand, the movements of the fingers are purposive. The purpose of the movements is to isolate and enhance the component of stimulation which specifies the shape and other characteristics of the object being touched. So you're moving your hand as you explore and you're doing that purposefully to get information about the things you're interested in. In robotics and AI, this idea has been pursued really since the 80s by Rowena Bashi. Uh, she said something very similar, but she put it in a much more mathematical uh, Bayesian framework. Uh, active sensing is purposefully changing the sensor state parameters according to sensing strategies. That is, depending on the current state of the data interpretation, and the goal or the task. So depending on what you know already and what it is that you'd like to find out, that's on the basis of that, you try and compute your best strategy for sensing. Uh, Michael Land said in the context of uh, vision, every visual task has an eye movement pattern that goes with it. So depending on what your task is, then you're going to move your eyes, control your eyes, perhaps in a different way. In touch, uh, you could say much the same thing. In fact, uh, uh, Susan Lederman uh, has proposed a thing called exploratory procedures. These are sort of hand movements, finger movements that you would make depending on what type of surface feature you're trying to detect. So if you're interested in texture, then you might draw your finger across the surface uh, in a light way. If you're interested in shape, then you might palpate a surface with your fingers and make a series of discrete touches onto the surface. If you're interested in softness or hardness, then you might squeeze something between your fingers. So these different strategies are suitable to different kinds of information that you want to get. So um, we've been looking not at human touch, although that is an area we're starting to get into, but at the bristle touch. So this is a rat. Many animals, uh, in fact, all mammals except humans have whiskers at some point in their lives, uh, rats and mice and other rodents uh, and are whisking specialists. They move around in the dark. They use their whiskers a lot. Uh, if you watch uh, movies like Ratatouille, you get the mistaken impression that these are highly visual animals. Here's Ratatouille looking out over the beautiful the city of Paris. But in fact, uh, this is not really what he would see if he was a true rat. He would see something more like that or in fact, he would see the world like that. So he's not really a visual animal. He's an animal <laughs> that, uh, of course, it's right that he has a fantastic sense of smell, which is where the plot of Ratatouille is, is centered. But he also has a fantastic whiskered sense, and it, it always depresses me that these movies with rats and them, the, the, the whiskers are never moving, they're just stationary. There's a scene in Ratatouille where one rat encourages the other to keep whisking. Ah, <laughs> that would be good. The other sense of whisking. So um, this is a real rat. And uh, 
This is a, a friend of mine's pet rat called Nibbles uh, on my windowsill exploring, just doing ratty things. And what you notice immediately when you watch real rats is that the whiskers move um, all the time that they're exploring. And this is in real time. And uh, you can see that uh, sniffing is happening, olfaction, uh, some vision. But if you actually do this in the dark, behavior would be much the same. But the rapid back and forth movement of the whiskers is... Um, really characteristic of rat exploratory behavior. So we're interested in this because the rat uses the, the whisker system for many tasks. Obviously it uses it for exploring and detecting its environment. It also uses it for things like balance. There are parallels, I think, with uh, human fingertips. If you think in evolution, we lost our whiskers um, maybe 50 million years ago, or we, we our primate ancestors began to lose their whiskers at that time. And it was probably with the evolution of these things, which are kind of like whiskers on the end of long arms. So, uh, any, as... Any of the larger animals uh, use the whiskers for anything? Yeah, um, some... Uh, the monkeys don't use the whiskers. Yeah, the, generally it's smaller animals that, that use their whiskers. The largest uh, animal that I've seen it's using... constantly moving. Yeah, yeah. The largest animal I've seen using its, its, its whiskers is a koipu, which is a, a rodent around this size, about the size of a, a large dog. Um, and, uh, but the biggest rodent uh, doesn't use the capybara, doesn't seem to use its whiskers. So I think it's something that smaller animals do. I think particularly animals that are closer to the ground <coughs> use their whiskers more, and animals that are nocturnal. So we're looking at this model system to try and understand active sensing in mammalian brains. So there are some questions that we can ask about uh, active touch. First of all, um, not so much here, but, um, well, f first of all, we, we, we asked what evidence is there that touch behavior is actively controlled, uh, particularly in rats? So when I say actively controlled, I mean the strategy isn't just to move the whiskers, but it's to move the whiskers in some purposeful information gathering way, in other words, the, the, the whisking behavior should change in some way depending on the environment or the task. Then we want to ask, do different species have similar strategies? Uh, is an, another question is whether if there is an active control strategy you can use for whisking, is it something that you might compute online, that you might change your behavior as you're uh, exploring, or is it something that you've just evolved or developed and then is stable in adults? Uh, if it's developed, uh, is it experience dependent in its development? Can we quantify the difference that actively controlling the whiskers make compared to uh, just moving them or having them static? And can we take these benefits of active sensing that we see in animals and transfer them to artifacts, to, to our robots? So the nice thing about uh, studying the rat vibrissal system from this point of view is that we already know a huge amount about the neurobiology of uh, the rat brain, particularly in relation to the vibrissal system. If you look at the cortex of a rat, uh, and uh, we got some of this from John Cass last week, you'll see that there are different areas in cortex where the cells respond primarily to one sensory modality, and in the rat, there's a really large area that responds to touch, the somatosensory cortex. And within somatosensory cortex, there is an area which is specialized for vibrissi. Is there a pointer? And uh, this is called the barrel field. And within the barrel field, there are groups of cells uh, for each whisker. So, um, and those are called the barrels. And you can see from that picture at the top, this is uh, a photograph taken of the surface of the cortex after it's been stained, and you can see these darker shapes, each one of which um, is a, a group of cells that respond preferentially to one whisker. So what you can do as an experimentalist is you can deflect one whisker. Oh, what did I do now? Uh, uh, nice. buttons might also work. And that's the point. So, so these are the barrels up here. You deflect a whisker here, say um, you might deflect a particular whisker in the middle, and then you can know where exactly to look 
within the cortex to get a strong response to that whisker deflection. And this has made this a really beautiful model for biologists who want to explore uh, sensory processing of mammalian brains because you can isolate uh, the, the stimulus, you can decide how to deflect this, you can deflect it in a very controlled way and you can look in a very specific place to find out how the brain is responding to that stimulus. Tony, do primates have barrel cortex? I've often wondered. You know? um, I, I don't think, uh, well they have uh, somatic cor sensory cortex for that area of the face but they don't have barrels. And there's a lot of comparative work looking at which species have barrels and which ones don't. Again, I think it's mainly the smaller uh, ma mammals, particularly rodents, that have barrels. But not every rodent has barrels. So, I mean, where would a moustache project anyway? Um, that would probably project to a similar area of cortex, but there probably wouldn't be uh, specific barrels. I mean, there'll probably be a, there'll be a topographic map uh, in your somatosensory cortex for your moustache, but not, not a single barrel for each hair. I don't think, you know. So, um, whoops. So this is the pathway uh, that goes up from the vibrissae uh, through the brainstem, through the thalamus, up to the barrel cortex. And in this diagram, it's this pathway here. And this is the one that's uh, most studied. So if you look in PubMed, you'll see uh, hundreds of articles on, on, on this structure, the sensory cortex, and on this pathway every year. But this pathway is just one part of a really interesting uh, looped architecture for processing vibrissal signals and controlling the movement of the vibrissae. So starting from down here, we have the vibrissae. The trigeminal ganglion does some processing on the vibrissal signals and uh, alters the, the representation of those probably in some interesting ways. The first loop by which the vibrissae can alter the control, the movement of the vibrissae is via the brainstem. So this trigeminal complex loops back to an area called the facial nucleus, which has the motor neurons that actually move the vibrissae. And so at this point, uh, deflection of the vibrissae can change the movement of the whiskers. Then there's a loop through the midbrain, through a structure called uh, the superior colliculus, um, which can again feedback by the facial nucleus to change the position of the vibrissae and the cerebellum has a role here in influencing the superior colliculus. Oops. Yeah, and the basal ganglia here is important in uh, selecting. We've done a lot of work uh, in, in our group on the role of the basal ganglia in action selection. And so the basal ganglia influences these systems and can control what actions the animal chooses to make. So there are these loops at all the different levels of the brain. And uh, our goal uh, in our group is to understand the control in each of these different loops and to try and build it, to build computational models of it, and to get these computational models working inside robots. Right, at this point, I'll see if this video on the stick is working. No. No, the video, the video's not working. So, um, there's a video here which isn't playing, which is supposed to show you what happens when you tweak a whisker. Here, the one whisker, the C2 whisker, and you look at the activity that you get in the somatosensory cortex, which is up here, and in the motor cortex, which is up here. And in fact, these are still frames from the video, which uh, just summarize what's going on. And this is work from the Peterson group from uh, Switzerland, from Zurich. And what happens if you tweak a whisker, and this is the barrel field, and that would be the barrel corresponding to this whisker, the C2 barrel. And this is within 14 milliseconds of moving that whisker. So this is very fast, but it's going up here. It's generating some activity there. 22 milliseconds after deflecting the whisker, you can see that the activity is spreading throughout the barrel field. This is the barrel field here. This is the motor cortex up here. So the signal's going to the barrels, and then it's coming to the motor cortex. The motor cortex comes back, 
and can influence the movement of the whiskers. And what's interesting, that in the mouse, this signal is propagating across nearly all of cortex. So this is a change in membrane potential. This isn't actually a neural firing, but you can see that by just tweaking one whisker, you can have an influence on processing across nearly the whole of the cortical sheet. And it all happens extremely quickly. Were these animals um, lethal? Uh, no, these were awake animals. How did they visualize all of So this is, so they removed the skull, and then this is voltage sensitive dye imaging. Wow. It's very cool stuff, and there's, there's lots of videos if you can get them to work. Dye? Yeah. Yeah. Like here. So this is 14 milliseconds after the onset of the, <coughs> the, the whisker movement, and they detect some activity after just 8 milliseconds. But this is a change in membrane potential, and so they're firing slightly later. You have another question there in the yeah. uh, Is it clear if you have activity spreading from the barrel cortex to the motor cortex, or if there are afferent activity from the motor uh, neurons? Um, I think in this case, y y because the motor, because the, wi the, the in this case the, the mouse wasn't whisking, so um, the motor cortex was silent initially, and so this would be uh, a sensory signal coming from the barrels to the motor cortex, and in fact crossing over to the other side of the brain as well. So, um, but you're right that in general there could be activity in the motor cortex when the animal was whisking, um, and. Uh, the motor cortex and, and the somatosensory cortex have a, a lot of interconnections. Do you see the motor cortex lighting up as a signature of active texture? Um, well, certainly the, what happens in motor cortex depends very much on the inputs from somatosensory cortex. And uh, this group have also shown that if you lesion somatosensory cortex uh, and you stimulate in the motor cortex, you get very different whisking behavior than if somatosensory cortex is intact. So whatever the motor cortex is doing, and it's not clear because you can lesion motor cortex and still get whisker movement, um, it's doing it depending on some, some representation of the input in the cortex. So these are the uh, various robots that we've built, and I'll give you examples of some of the work we've done with each of these robots as we go along. We've been doing this work since 2003, and this was our first robot called Whiskerbot. You can see him here with three whiskers in a row. Um, most of the time we did experiments with one whiskers. Uh, so, uh, Joe, you'd be interested that we use Nitinol here to move the whiskers. And uh, in order to do that, we had to cool down. The, the Nitinol is kind of a wire that you pass a current through it and it contracts. But to get it to go back to its, its normal length, you have to cool it down. So this thing that looks like a nose here is actually a fan blowing air onto the nitinol wires. So this was uh, a nice solution, and I'll show you a little bit more in a second, but uh, difficult to scale. So our second robot, Scratchbot, we put the whiskers in columns. We had three in each column, and we used uh, standards at the DC motors. And uh, what we've done most recently is build these uh, individual actuated whiskers, which use a, a fairly standard micro uh, DC motor and also have embedded electronics. And then we can configure them in any way we like. So for instance, this is a, uh, a cone-shaped whisker array on the end of a robot arm. So this is uh, Scratchbot uh, doing some exploratory behavior. Um, I'll go into a bit more detail later on about w what Scratchbot is doing and how it's being controlled. So the reason for doing this work in robots is first of all that touch is an underused sensory modality in robots. We tend to put uh, vision sensors on robots and we use laser rangefinders, infrared, ultrasound, but there's very little use of physical touch uh, beyond sort of bump sensors. And uh, there's work now on fingertips for humanoids, but there are some limitations for fingertips. If you put the uh, expensive sensor right on the end of the effector and then you rub it against surfaces, you're going to wear out your sensor. Whereas if you put your uh, expensive microelectronics at the base of a whisker, and the, and the whisker itself is just a, a piece of plastic, you're not so worried if that gets worn a little bit. So there's good reasons, I think, why animals 
uh, are using vibrissi, which are just hairs. Uh, there's no sensing within the hair, and the sensing is all at the base. So uh, tactile sensing is an important problem for robots. I think if we're going to have robots that interact closely with the world, we need to develop a sense of touch for them. And from my point of view, uh, the robot is useful for testing theories about brain function. And I'll give you some examples of how it's useful. The first is in finding out what the important questions are. As a biologist, you may think you know what questions you need to ask about the biology, about the system you're studying. But when you try to build a robot, it turns out you come up with lots of different questions. And those are sometimes very important questions to take back to the biology. The second is that when you try and build a robot, you sometimes discover that the things that look easy for animals to do, and that you might think, oh, this is, not a, this is a trivial problem to solve, turn out to be quite hard. And that things that you think uh, are really quite hard to do, they may turn out to be easy. So we can find out what the important questions are. We can find out what are the hard things, the hard tasks that the brain must try to solve. And the third thing is that we can do experiments that can't be done in animals or that would be very hard to do in animals. So we can use this as a physical model of the animal to ask questions about function we couldn't ask in the animal. And uh, what we've been doing is developing a biomimetic control architecture for our robots. Sorry. Whoops. Um, so this is the control architecture of the rat brain. And this is uh, a version that was running in Scratchbot of the control architecture. And you can see that we're trying to replicate aspects of these uh, brainstem loops, uh, midbrain loops. And at this point, we didn't have anything in the cortical loop but it was our ambition, and our new robot, Shrewbot, uh, does have or is going to have a cortical loop. So I'll go very quickly through this. So it's important, I think, if you're building a robot analog of a biological sensory system to get the sensory transduction right, to make sure that you've understood how the deflection uh, of a whisker, in this case, is converted into some pattern of neural discharge. So um, one of the first things we did was to uh, build a mechanical model of what we think is going on inside the follicle. So every hair you have is embedded uh, within a, a fairly complicated structure called a follicle. In the case of vibrissi, the, the follicle has um, a, a sinus in it which is filled with blood. It's also therefore called a sinus hair. And around the base of the shaft and in different parts of the follicle, there are many, many mechanoresensors, hun hundreds of these things, and these are the things that are, that are picking up the deflection of the whisker. So we built a mechanical model of some of the physical structures inside the follicle, a fairly simplified one, and then we had a uh, model of, uh, essentially we, we measured the strain in some uh, model springs in this mechanical model, and we used that to estimate what we thought was happening to the mechanoreceptors. We fed that through a spiking neural model of the primary afferent neurons, and we were able to show that we could uh, simulate some of the data that's been, been uh, obtained by recording in those primary afferent neurons. So you could Akasar's group implanted neurons inside the, uh, the nerve that takes the signals from the vibrissi up into the brain, and they recorded different patterns of activity depending on different types of deflections and from different neurons. And we've been able to simulate all of these. So the details in the paper of how we did that. So these are the three different cells that I saw. Just so um, generally, uh, if you record in the primary afferents, uh, you get some cells which just respond when there's a contact. Um, so th they have a fast response. And then you have some cells which respond when there's a contact and then they stay on, so the more slowly responding ones. And then this is a cell that just responds when the whisker comes away from the surface. But if the contact was in another direction, this might be an on contact. So, so it depends. Uh, so we, we modeled these cells as being distributed around the follicle. Then depending on the, the direction of deflection, you get different timing of the responses. And this was our first attempt to build an artificial whisker, and this is the nitinol wire that's moving the whisker. There you can see we're getting about sort of four hertz. I think we, we drove it as fast as, as six hertz with that nitinol. 
Sorry? What gauge is it from? Oh, you'd have to ask Martin. <laughs> Jesus, that's, that's really impressive. Right, oh, okay. Well, it's, it's, um, I think it's published. In the, the, yeah, it's definitely published. So, um, a lot of our work has focused on how sensing modulates the movement of the whiskers, and that's what I want to focus on now. So, we originally thought we could uh, build a, a robot rat with whiskers without having to uh, study rats directly, since many other people were studying rat behavior. We quickly discovered that the questions that the robotics people were asking could not be answered from the literature, and I'll give you an example in a minute. And at that point we said, well, we have rats, we're a psychology department, we have a neuroscience floor, we have rats upstairs, let's go and, and film them. And then we, we quickly discovered that you have to film at high speeds, you have to have very bright lights in order to see the, the whiskers. Uh, in order to control for vision, we were very fortunate that there were some experiments going on on uh, retinal dystrophy, the, the, the loss of retinal cells, and they had an animal model for that, which is the Royal College of Surgeons rat which loses its retinal cells by age three months. So these animals are functionally blind and moving around basically just using their whiskers. So we already had a control for, for sight, which meant we could use a very bright light box. We built this light box specifically for this task because uh, existing light boxes were either too expensive or not bright enough. And then we put a high-speed camera above it and there's a mirror here so we can see side on what the whiskers are doing as well as see from overhead what the whiskers are doing. So we built this apparatus. This is about the third generation of what we built. And then we, we just stood there. We waited for the rat to come under the field of view of the camera and then recorded short clips. And I'll show you some examples. So if you film a, a rat from above, then uh, what you notice, first of all, is this sweeping of the whiskers forwards and backwards like this. And this has been observed many times. This is. Um, a graph from Phil Ziegler's lab and you can see the left and right whiskers uh, moving more or less synchronously <coughs> and with similar amplitude. And this is what happens when the rat whisks in open space. And um, you can see that over time there's some changes in the amplitude and there can also be changes in frequency. But at any one time they seem to be moving synchronously and symmetrically. Now one of the questions that uh, the robotics people asked us, so this was in the literature, was um, well, do the whiskers sweep across the floor? They look like they're sweeping across the floor. Is that what we should do in our robot? And we said, well, I don't know. Let's, let's, let's have a look at what rats do. <laughs> so with our side-on view, we can now answer that question. So do they sweep across the floor? No, not really. Not most of the time anyway. So when the rat is exploring along the floor like this, it looks like sweeping. <coughs> but actually, the whiskers come down and touch and go up again. Let me play that again. You can see these whiskers coming down, touching, going up again, down, up, down, up. And some of the whiskers in the bottom rows do spend most of their time on the floor, but uh, the middle rows and the top rows spend a lot of time in the air, and they come down and they touch, uh, not always synchronously, they sometimes touch in different orders, and I think Mitch will talk about this, so I won't, I won't go into that. But we can see that there is almost uh, a discrete set of samples. Certainly on each whisker, you can say that there's a time when it's touching, then it comes away and touches again. And uh, so, th so that's the kind of activity that we want to get in our robots. Uh, sets of contacts uh, that you get for each whisk. Now, um, there are various ways in which uh, the whiskers appear to be controlled depending on the movement of the animal and depending on the contacts that it gets. So this is a result that uh, Mitra's uh, group that sh showed, and she'll probably go into it in more detail. I just want to show it in this example. This is a 16-day-old <coughs> rat pup, and, uh, and this is an adult animal. And what you see, this is an adult turning to the left, and what you see is that the whiskers uh, in the direction of the turn are pulled back towards the face more than they would be if the rat was just facing forward. And the whiskers on the opposite side of the turn are pushing round in the direction that the rat is going. So, and this uh, uh, child rat, infant rat, that is circling, you can more or less see that as well, that the whiskers are, as he's turning, the whiskers are turning in the direction that he's going. So this is, uh, we think, an example of active control 
if you're turning in this direction, you might want your whiskers to, to turn with you and lead the way. So, another example of active control is when an animal is interacting with objects, and this is where we've done a lot of our work. So, here we have a perspex block. So if you notice, this is fairly symmetric whisking. As he comes around here, these whiskers are hardly moving. These ones are moving a lot. So the whiskers uh, close to the object are moving a lot less. The whiskers away from the object are moving a lot more, almost as if they're reaching round to try and contact the object. This is uh, slightly more complicated. The, this cylinder here, the thing to notice is the whiskers coming over the top here. And uh, you can see here that, that the whiskers at the back uh, move and the whiskers at the front, sorry, the whiskers at the back hardly move at one point and the whiskers at the front move a lot. So there's, in this movie, and we don't have many examples of this, but I think this is proof in principle that there can be a different control on the different columns of whiskers. These ones moving quite hard, these ones moving hardly at all. So I think you cannot really argue that uh, the rat has many degrees of freedom for controlling the whiskers. Not that different, possibly, from the degrees of freedom we have for controlling our fingers. After all, we, we can't control our fingers entirely independently of each other. So, so these are examples of what we call contact-induced asymmetry, this idea that the whiskers close to an object will move a lot less than the whiskers that are further away. The whiskers that are further away are reaching round to try and reach the object. If these movies will play. So um, one thing we worry about is whether these things that we record in laboratory strains that have been bred in uh, laboratories for generations and whose daily life consists of running around a very boring cage full of sawdust, whether that's really representative of what the natural animal would do. So this is actually a recording of uh, a wild-caught brown rat. And uh, we have uh, a number of recordings now of wild rodents. And the behavior is, is very similar to the one that we see in the lab animals, which is reassuring. Uh, I think that the whisker field actually looks, it looks like you've got a bit more of a flourishing growth there of whiskers from being a wild animal than being a laboratory animal. But we haven't quantified that yet something to, to look at, perhaps. And that, that would be because it's in boilings, it's richer? Or, you know, it's a different strain. You know, the, the laboratory ones have been li living in labs for so long. But I don't know. So. When you say it's wild caught, is it caught inland or near the shore? Because the, the wharf rats live in the inner tidal and keep right. the seafood. Um, uh, I think this would be caught inland, but it's a good question. It was, it, it's from... A wildlife sanctuary in Kent, which is quite near the coast, so, so it may have lived on the coast. Um, and, and this is a, a Norway rat, so not, not a ship rat, and the ship rats are quite different. So we wanted to make sure that this pattern, where you see uh, less movement on the whiskers that are close uh, to, the, to the surface and more movement on the whiskers further away, was not just a consequence of the whiskers touching the surface and then stopping because there's something there and they can't move any further. So what we did was implant the uh, whisking muscles with electrodes so we, could, uh, uh, so we could record EMG, we could record the actual whisking signals. And then we put a small stereo transmitter on the rat's head and then we checked that the signal coming from uh, the whisking muscles correlated quite strongly with the amplitude of the whisk. And this video will show that there might be sound, so um, does this still work? So the sound is just a, a correlate of the amplitude of the whisk, which you also see in these histograms down here. So high pitch means larger whisk. And you'll see these become more asymmetric and the sounds of, of the two channels becoming more different. So strong whisking on this side, hardly any movement at all on that side. So in this clip, you'll see an animal moving around, and this now is real time. And uh, we can track 
So this is the stereo transmitter. We can track the position of the stereo transmitter. We can track the nose of the rat and know where he is inside this box. You'll hear the raw EMG signal now. So that's the signals coming off the whisking muscles on both sides. And so we calculate the position of the rat relative to the walls at each instant, uh, the distance from the nose to the wall, and the angle relative to the walls. And then we can calculate the asymmetry between the left and right uh, whisker drives um, for those different positions. And essentially what this plot is showing you <coughs> that um, if uh, the close to the wall, on the side close to the wall, red is showing uh, less protraction. So uh, the, when the rat is near parallel to the wall as it is here, the whiskers here hardly move at all and the whiskers on the other side push round a lot. Blue is showing you increased protraction on the contralateral side. Interestingly, if uh, the rat is nose on to the wall, it's facing a wall, then if the wall is slightly further away, there, com there can be some increased protraction, as though he knows that there's a wall there and he's reaching towards it. So what we've done um, most recently, and uh, publishing this this year in uh, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, is to compare this in the rat, in the mouse, and in this creature, which is uh, uh, marsupial, Monodelphus domestica, it's uh, the op an opossum, and you see these graphs showing that this uh, reduced protraction ipsilaterally, increased protraction or whisking movement contralaterally, that's in the rat, that's similar in the mouse, a bit messier perhaps, and this is in the opossum. So you see this pattern of active control in all of these species. And that it's in the, this marsupial opossum is very interesting because uh, opossums, marsupials, are very distant relatives of rodents. And uh, if all of these animals have active whisking, then probably, possibly some ancestral stem mammal also had active whisking. And I can talk more about this comparative stuff later if you're interested. So um, another finding is that when the, witches, the whiskers touch a surface, sometimes, perhaps not always, they stop moving and start to retract uh, quite soon after touching. So if you watch this clip, it keeps repeating. You see the whiskers moving synchronously there, then there's a touch here, and the whiskers on this side go back. And if you watch it again, you'll see that the whiskers on the other side continue to move forward and go back slightly later. So these ones go back now, these go, ones go back then. So you start off synchronously whisking, and then there's a contact here, these whiskers go back, the other ones are still moving, and then they go back later. And so you get this very brief period of asynchrony, which can continue if there's more contacts uh, that are uneven between the two sides uh, before the animal goes back to synchronously moving the whiskers. And what we found was that uh, the retraction of the whiskers on the side that makes the contact happens very quickly within about uh, 12 to 15 milliseconds of the contact. So you can make a contact here and then uh, mo the whiskers move back within the short time frame. And on the contralateral side, there's no relationship between the contact and when the whiskers start to retract. They're not affected directly by the contact. <coughs> Yeah. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think if oh, it's a good question. I don't think they do. I don't think it's specifically um, a a any cells that would um, contribute to the pain pathways. Do you know, Mitra? I think it's just a, a sensory pathway. I mean, you mean on the whisker itself, or in the? I mean, the whiskers the themselves. Yeah. Well, I mean, there'll be, pain, there'll be pain sensors in the skin around the base of the whisker, but I don't know if there are pain sensors in the follicle. So there, so there will be pain sensors in the follicle, but, but, but they would be responding to damage to the follicle rather than bending of the whisker, I think. Yeah. So I think if the question is, you know, if the, the whiskers are really bent hard, is that painful? I would, th I would think not. So. So what we've been doing is, one of the things we've been doing is building models of the pattern generators which would generate uh, these whisker movements. And I'm not going to give you the details of these, but if 
We've built various versions of these, some of them with spiking neurons, some without. And um, if you imagine two pattern generators, one for each side, and then modulation by whisker contact of the pattern generator, so if there's a deflection of this whisker here, then the pattern generator uh, for the opposite side could get some excitation to increase the amplitude of the whisk, and the pattern generator for that side could get some inhibition to reduce the amplitude of the whisk then you could imagine that that mechanism would produce these kinds of asymmetries. So um, that's just a, a video to remind you of, of the asymmetry that we see in the rat, sort of increased whisking, a contralateral to the contact. And this bottom one is WhiskerBot, our first robot. You can see you put a pen in the whisker field and you get this reduced bending of the whisker. Or you can see that it's... Um, whisking a lot less on the side where that contact is and continues to whisk on the opposite side. If you uh, look close up what's happening there, you can see that when the whisker feedback is off, that you get a lot of bending in the shaft of the whisker. You get a prolonged contact. Now we can turn the feedback on so that we get this light touch and you can see a briefer contact, much less bending in the shaft. That's predictable, of course, because We've, we're, we're not forcing the whisker into the object. Now, we could then uh, do that experiment and use our model of the primary afferent neurons and see that the signal that would be transmitted to the brain as a consequence of those contacts is going to be different. So if, if the drive is off, if the feedback is off, then you get uh, longer signals and you can get... Um, so this, these are the... Uh, rapidly adapting neurons that, that give a fast response, the red ones, the black ones are slowly adapting, they give a more prolonged response. And you can see that these responses are longer and noisier than when the feedback is switched on. So when the feedback is switched on, you get a different type of signal going up to the rest of the brain from uh, the brainstem, from the primary reference, if this is what the animal is doing. So um, uh, the suggestion of this is that if people uh, want to th think about what's happening when the rat is exploring a cloth floors, making these brief contacts coming off again, uh, and the consequences of that for activity in the cortex, that they should be thinking about shorter periods of deflection rather than long, uh, quite pronounced deflections of the whiskers. You can get long periods of deflection but um, when, the when the animal is exploring, but, but, but our suggestion is that there will be less pushing into the surface. So that's what we mean when we say a lighter touch. So just one more example of uh, active control. When the animal is exploring uh, a surface, you can see the whiskers uh, coming closer together. When he's moving across the floor, the whiskers are spread out. When he's exploring into this vertical surface, you can see the whiskers coming closer together. We call it reduced spread between the whiskers. What's actually happening is that uh, normally when he's whisking, the the whiskers towards the front will move faster than the ones at the back, so they'll spread out as they go forward. Uh, in this case, the whiskers at the back are going at a similar speed to the ones at the front, so they all stay converged together. And that, that should give you more contacts. Um, we tested that. We, we built a model based on an, the idea of, of inhibition of the whiskers near the front that might make the contact, excitation of the whiskers towards the back, and also excitation of the whiskers on the opposite side. And if you do that, and we did that in our latest robot, Shruba, I'll show you later, then you increase the number of contacts on different types of surfaces. We looked at a, uh, sort of a spherical surface, and we looked at a flat surface, and we showed that this kind of control would just give you more contacts. It's fairly uh, intuitive that that should happen, but we wanted to demonstrate straight at quant quantitatively. Um, you also get... Um, as a consequence of this kind of control, you get a sort of more normalized contact. So th this is an initial contact on these whiskers. You see this one is very strongly bent back. has a strong signal. Uh, th this one, the green one, has some signal. The one at the back has hardly any signal. But then if you have the feedback, negative at the front, positive at the back, then you get more uniform contacts on the three uh, columns of whiskers. So... Um, these kinds of mechanisms could be operating at the brainstem. We haven't proved that. Um, they could involve higher loops, but it, it's, it's possible. Um, one thing that's likely to require a midbrain loop 
is orienting towards objects. When you make a contact with something, uh, you generally orient uh, and explore. So these are some uh, overhead videos of rats moving up a corridor. The rat is trained to run along this corridor. If he makes a contact on a whisker, he generally turns and explores the object with his long whiskers and also with short microvibrissae on the chin. So this is just two examples of an object, an unexpected object uh, that's to one side and this is uh, an object on the floor, so, sort of a raised step on the floor. You can see orienting to the floor and here orienting to the right and to the left. If you look close up at what a rat is doing once he's oriented, you can see that he's exploring with these microvibrissae, these really short whiskers uh, that don't move on the chin and their lower lip and sort of pushing those against the surface at the same time as whisking with these long whiskers. So in order to orient accurately, uh, if you have a, a deflection of the whisker, you need to know where the whisker was in space when it contacted so that you can calculate the position in space you have to orient to. So you, you need to know not <coughs> just that there was a contact, but how far the whisker had moved through its arc. So you want to know its angle or some representation of its position in its arc. So there's the hypothesis that there are cells that encode the angle of arc of the whisker. And if you can do the coincidence detection between that and contacts, then you can say whereabouts in space the contact was and orient towards it. Yeah. I know, I know. That's a bum. I don't want to get into that now. Okay, sorry. So, so there's a big controversy here, which you maybe talk about. But, but there's certainly, the, there's certainly the hypothesis that there are cells which encode angular position, which has been put forward. But I agree, it's controversial. So, everybody agrees. There's no data that shows. Does Ehud agree? Yeah, I think Ehud agrees. Okay. Well, I think we should talk about it later, okay. sort of, because it's. Uh, uh, there are other ways that you could encode this. So this, this is the simplest one, is to con encode angular position. Everyone okay. confused. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, the thing is that you want to know where the whiskers are, not just uh, that there was a contact on the whisker. You want to know something about where the whisker was when it made the contact. And uh, there is evidence behaviorally, I think, from those videos, that the rat knows where its whiskers are. But how that's encoded is a good question. So uh, it has been pro proposed that there are cells that encode the angle. But uh, there are also proposals that it encodes the phase in the whisk cycle. And there's many other. There's no, no, those are, no, it is not correct to say that those are two complementary hypotheses. I know. They, they are different hypotheses. They, that they do not, giving phase coding alone does not tell the rat anything about where its whiskers are. Uh, you, if you knew the set point and the phase. If you knew yeah, the set point, yeah, but there's yeah. no evidence that yeah. So there, there are different ways of getting the position of the whisker in space. And so we, we chose one of the simplest ones, which is to say that we encode the angle of the whisker, because we can do that very easily in the robot. But thanks for pointing this out. So if we do that, uh, and then we build this coincident detection system into our model robot, and uh, we, um, we're, we're basing this on the hypothesis that the colliculus um, the superior colliculus in the midbrain is a place where you get convergence of not just uh, tactile stimuli but also of visual stimuli and there's a head centered map in the superior colliculus which you could use and is used to, to, to drive eye movements in particular positions. So that same head centered map could be used to control orienting movements based on vibrissal signals and there's evidence that if you lesion the colliculus then you do affect uh, the ability of these animals to make orients to positions in space. And if you look it, within the superior colliculus at the representation of whiskers, you see that there, is, there are very broadly tuned receptive fields for whiskers in superior colliculus. So um, it could be that rather than encoding specific whiskers, that uh, the cells in superior colliculus are encoding positions in space. And that way, you would expect to get broadly tuned receptive fields because the same whisker uh, might trigger uh, cells in different positions depending on whereabouts it is within its sweep. So based on that hypothesis, we think that there's, uh, well, there are known to be cells in, in the cortex that calculate the, the coincidence of a contact and uh, some correlate of angular position. 
And based on those, you can decide where to orient, and that's what our robot does. So this is the robot that you saw before. This is Martin Pearson putting an object in its whisker field, and it's doing an orient to that position, and it uses its microvibrissi then to touch against the object. And this is the same thing happening in simulation. Uh, another thing to know is that we, we need to decide whether to orient or not to orient, and we use a model of basal ganglia to do that action selection task. Now, um, this turned out to be a problem that looks easy, because you think, I just need to calculate some correlate of where the whisker is in space and whether there was a contact, and then I can calculate whereabouts in head center coordinates I need to move my head. It turns out that you can get noise on these uh, whisker detectors, on these contact detectors, um, as a consequence of moving the whiskers. Just moving the whiskers can cause you to detect <coughs> what you think is a contact and it's not a contact. And this is the result of your own movement. Now, if you could predict what sensory signals you would get as the consequence of your own movement, then you could recognize those things as noise and you could cancel those out. And that would give you the ability to better predict or to recognize actual contacts. Now, there's interesting evidence that the cerebellum could be the part of the brain that's involved in making this prediction, saying, uh, this is a signal that I generated and it's not as a consequence of my interaction with the outside world. And there's data, for instance, from brain imaging studies. We know that it's difficult to tickle yourself, but someone else can tickle you. Uh, if you tickle yourself, your brain, your cerebellum, may be actively predicting the sensory consequence of that tickling movement. And that's why it doesn't make you, make you giggle. And there's evidence that the cerebellum is actively involved there from fMRI studies. There's evidence from studies in electric fish that cerebellar-like structures are involved in cancelling out the sensory consequences of your own movement. And so we have a model of the cerebellum which takes the motor command, the signal that you're sending to move the whiskers, and uses that to predict the sensory signal that would be as a result of that movement, and then you can subtract that from the actual signal and get a clean representation of contacts with the environment. And that model learns in real time and uh, what you see here, this is just a whisker moving in space. There's no contacts at all, so the signal should be flat. And the red signal here is showing you the uh, cleaned up signal, and this is during training. So this is the signal coming off the whisker sensor, the blue one. Initially, the clean signal is tracking the whisker signal, and then the cerebellum is gradually learning to predict the noise, and in this case, everything is noise, and then you can subtract it away and get a cleaned up version of the signal. And so this gives us much better uh, signal to noise ratio. So we can really detect contacts and not orient to things which aren't real contacts. Yeah? Are, are you using the correlation learning like uh, Paul Dune and... Uh, yeah, exactly, yes. It's a decorrelation learning algorithm that uh, John and Paul developed and was described last year. Okay. Um, so we've, we've looked at some of the structures in the midbrain that are involved here. We've got some hypotheses, and that's all I would call them, about what the superior calculus might be doing, about what the cerebellum might be doing. We, these could be tested against new data that could be collected from animals, and we have predictions for specific experiments. What about the, the sensory cortex? So we know that the sensory cortex uh, does uh, some interesting tactile discrimination. So if you ask an animal to learn to discriminate different surfaces on the basis of texture, and this is an animal that's been trained to do that. This is uh, a video from Jason Ritt. You can see that the whiskers moving along this uh, surface, which is uh, a piece of sandpaper. As they move along, uh, they seem to slip and then stick and slip and stick. And, and technically, this is called slip and stick. And uh, so you can look at these slip and stick patterns and you can do pattern recognition on them, and you can distinguish whether it's a smooth sandpaper or a coarse grain sandpaper on the basis of this. So um, since our first robot, we've been developing uh, discriminators for this, and, and this was Whiskerbot whisking against different grades of sandpaper, using different control strategies with and without uh, our feedback control, and we showed that we could discriminate different grades of sandpaper uh, using different kinds of classifiers. I'm not going to go into this in detail, but um, this is work that Nathan's been involved in most recently. 
This is uh, Scratchbot. Now, uh, we're seeing against the floor, you can see there's two different um, <coughs> types of floor surface here. There's a the change in the signal when it crosses over from one to the next. We've been using this device here, which is a two degree of freedom robot arm to generate whisker deflection patterns with different kinds of surfaces. And when we do that, this is a typical deflection pattern, we can train classifiers to extract properties of the stimulus from the whisker signal. Um, so there are several things you might want to extract from the signal. Um, we've trained classifiers now for radial distance, how far along the whisker the contact was. Um, for texture, we can discriminate different grades of sandpaper, different kinds of textures now. Uh, for novelty, we can discriminate whether it's something that we've detected before or not. Uh, and so we, we have now a, a library of these classifiers trained up on these whiskers, which are the same whiskers as on the robot, and we're now testing whether the classifiers that we've trained on this table will actually work with data from the real world in uh, several different robots. Well, sorry, this is data from the real world, but it's not from an uh, autonomous moving robot. Now, uh, this is uh, the robot that you saw before. It's called the, the Biotac sensor. This is the one on the end of a robot arm. This one has just two, two rows of three whiskers. And we did some experiments on uh, extracting texture and distance simultaneously using classifiers and using different control strategies with and without this uh, rapid cessation of protraction where, where, you, where you touch something, you stop uh, protracting the, the whiskers quickly. And uh, this data is actually quite complex. We've done a lot of experiments now, but an early experiment suggested that there may be some benefit to the rapid cessation and protraction in making these kinds of discriminations. But we're working on this now to see in what cases it helps and in what cases it might not help. This is Scratchbot exploring around in uh, an environment, whisking against uh, surfaces. So our goal is to use texture uh, and other tactile signals to build up maps of the world. We want to be uh, using touch to do mapping. So we want to imagine what it's like to be an animal moving around in darkness, relying on your sense of touch to tell you where you are. So we want to be able to extract shape, texture, other kinds of tactile cues, and also know where you are in space to build up these tactile maps. We've been doing quite a lot of work on what, what it would mean to have tactile simultaneous localization and mapping, tactile SLAM, and uh, Charles Fox, this is a simulation, but Charles Fox has been doing some work on uh, using touch to discriminate tables and chairs uh, in a simplified environment using uh, whisker signals. And we've recently tested this also on a robot platform. So the barrel cortex, uh, this is the final bit of my talk, uh, is uh, like the rest of mammalian cortex, a six layer structure. And it's uh, uh, one of the areas people are focusing on to try and determine what sort of computations are performed within cortex. As I explained before, we can do these very nicely controlled experiments with barrel cortex where we deflect one whisker and we know exactly where to record to get a response to that deflection. So this structure, uh, the, the barrel cortical column, has been really... Uh, heavily analyzed. And so this picture, this is a drawing from Michael Brecht, but this, this picture of a barrel here is to suggest that, particularly in, in layer four, when you stain the cortex in the right way, you get this shape. These cells become stained a darker color, and you can then detect the barrel. But then that's just the layer four, and then above that there's uh, some layers of neurons. Below that there's some more layers of neurons. And people have looked at the anatomy of the connectivity within this column and shown where some of the major connections lie. So the input comes into these layer 4 cells, these barrel cells, and then it goes up to layer 2, 3, and then it also comes down to layer 5. There's, more, uh, there's, there's a lot of interactions going on here, but one of the main pathways is to come in at layer 4, go up to layer 2, 3, and go down to layer 5, and then from layer 5, there are projections out to places like the superior colliculus, which is doing our orienting, to the cerebellum, which is perhaps doing our noise cancellation, and so on, and to the basal ganglia, which is perhaps selecting whether this is an object 
we're interested in exploring or not. So within this circuit, there is perhaps a three-layer network which is doing some interesting pattern recognition and helping the rest of the brain to decide what we should do next. So we've been building uh, models of the barrel cortex, uh, thinking about what might be going on within these cortical columns. So one piece of data that's interesting is that if you look inside a single barrel and you deflect the whiskers in different directions, then it turns out certainly in older animals that have had some rich uh, experience, I think that if they're brought up in enriched environments, this is a stronger effect. You see this um, organization of the cells via the direction of deflection. This is similar to what you might find in visual cortex and people call a pinwheel map for orientation. So in the rat barrel, uh, Andaman and Moore have proposed that there's something like a pinwheel map for the direction of deflection of the whisker. So what we wanted to do was to see if the same principles of self-organization that, that appear to generate pinwheel maps in visual cortex can also work for these orientation maps in the whisker barrel. So Stuart Wilson uh, did these simulation experiments where we pass stimuli through the whisker field. We imagine a grid of five by five whiskers here. We pass stimuli in different directions. We add some noise here because the whiskers won't always uh, deflect exactly with the direction of the stimulus shape. We start off with uh, no direction preference or random direction preference in the cells. This is a grid of five by five barrels. And then we use a, a self-organizing algorithm based on one that's been tested for models of visual cortex and validated against a great deal of data from Jim Bednar. And we can show that, that using this algorithm and assumptions about the connectivity, that we can uh, evolve these kind of direction maps. This is uh, some examples of what happens when you're running the model. Uh, you, you pass a shape or a model of a shape through the whisker field and then you allow the activity to propagate from the layer 4 cells up to the layer 2, 3 cells and then it's really a recurrent network so you have to let it settle or you have to, have to let the activity propagate about in the network and see what happens. And if you do that during training then you get the activity uh, follows the leading edge of the stimulus as it passes through. So this is different stimuli shapes passing through these model uh, barrel cortical columns and this is the activity happening there and then this is the evolution of a pinwheel map as a consequence of heavy and learning here. So we have the typical Mexican hat thing going on so that within the layer two, three cells that we're modeling there's ex excitatory connections locally, inhibitory connections uh, over longer distances and then we use heavy and learning. The basic idea is that cells that f uh, fire at the same time uh, you, st you strengthen their connection and using that principle you can uh, develop these orientation maps. So another interesting uh, piece of data from uh, studies of the barrel cortex relates to the timing of deflection of two whiskers. So if you have two adjacent whiskers here and you have a stimulus that hits this whisker and this whisker, let's call this A and then this one B then you, you record in cells in barrel cortex, then you find that depending on the duration of this uh, interval, this interwhisker interval, that you get different effects. Sometimes the response of cells is, is suppressed as the result of there being a prior uh, deflection of an adjacent whisker. Sometimes it's facilitated by the prior deflection of the adjacent whisker. And this is data from a Japanese group of Shumegi. And what they found was that the response facilitation was strongest in the cells that were located in between two barrels. So this is this uh, green shape in the graph. So uh, blue is uh, the response of cells above barrel A, let's call this as this one. And uh, red is for barrel B. And then this is for the cells right in between. So say this is barrel A and this is barrel B then. In between these there's an area called the septum and those cells respond most strongly when the two whiskers uh, are deflected simultaneously. And you can see that they respond uh, less strongly when there's an interval 
uh, between the two deflections. And uh, so if A is deflected before B or B before A, then there's less response facilitation. So we thought this was a really interesting effect, and we thought, well, there might be a simple way of modeling this, which is to think about uh, signals propagating out from the two barrel centers. And so you can think about uh, the signals propagating out as kind of a ripple. And uh, this is where I really wanted to show you the, the video from the Peterson lab, because it really shows this kind of ripple effect of the uh, activity first being at the center of the barrel and then propagating out across the rest of barrel cortex, eventually propagating to motor cortex. But this is just um, a, a simple simulation that helps you imagine these propagating waves. And so if you have, uh, so if this is one whisker, this is another whisker, if you were to tweak both these whiskers at the same time, then the ripples would propagate out and they would hit each other uh, directly in the middle if they were tweaked at the same time. If this uh, whisker here was hit first, as in what's going to happen here, this one hits first, this one second, then the two ripples um, hit each other much further over towards the second whisker. So if you're thinking that there's going to be response facilitation as the result of these ripples meeting, then in the case when A is, is deflected before B, you'd expect the response facilitation to be in cells which are close to B. And this is the prediction of our model, that if you uh, look at different interwhisker deflection times, then you should be able to predict from there whereabouts in the cells between those two barrels you should get a, a facilitation of the response and elsewhere you may get suppression of response. And so there are, so the, cell, the signals coming in through layer four, it's going up to layer two, three, but shortly after this excitatory drive from layer four, there's an inhibitory drive. So another assumption of the model is that the excitation gets to layer two, three first, then uh, uh, the inhib inhibition starts later, but it propagates faster. So the excitation uh, tends to drive these layer two, three cells for a short period before they get hit by a wave of inhibition. So if you combine this excitation with inhibition and you set the timing according to these kinds of ripple effects, then we get a prediction about how uh, these cells might code for the uh, interwhisker interval, the time between the deflection of the two signals. And of course, that, that's encoding the speed at which the uh, object is moving through the whiskers. So you're getting the velocity of the stimulus from this. And the, yeah. yeah, this is almost finished. So this is, uh, that was the Schmeggy data, and this is the simulation data uh, that we've generated, or I should say Stuart's generated, based on this hypothesis of... Um, and another way to think about this is it's, it's like a place code. Uh, a guy called Jeffress proposed this for the uh, uh, auditory system, is it that, that you take... Uh, you want to represent time differences, and you do a time-to-space conversion. You take the timing of two signals that's slightly offset, and then you use an array of neurons to represent different uh, time intervals. So this is like a Jeffress model, a place code for interwhisker deflections. If you have uh, two deflections, that can tell you something about uh, the direction of movement of the stimulus as well as its velocity. And if you have three, then, then it uniquely specifies a direction. So you could use these signals, if this is what layer two, three cells do, you could use those signals to then calculate velocity and direction of a stimulus moving through the whisker field. If you look in uh, layer five of the barrel cortex, then you get cells which are tuned to global direction of deflection across the whisker field rather than to local direction deflection. This is data from Dan Schultz group in um, Paris. So in layer five, you tend to have more uh, neurons that are more broadly tuned to multiple whiskers whereas in layer four, they're more specifically tuned to single whiskers. And this broad tuning to multiple whiskers could be encoding properties of stimulus shape. So, uh, and, and what we've done recently, I haven't got slides for it yet, is shown that we can use this kind of encoding to represent different curvatures of stimulus. So we'll be able to recognize the speed and the direction of the stimulus and also some properties of its shape in a simple network based on barrel cortex. 
So, um, I'm, I'm just summing up now. So, uh, why would we move the miscus? This is a question that we haven't really uh, answered uh, definitively in, in whisker research after so much time about it. Some proposals that I have is that by moving the whiskers, obviously you have more degrees of freedom for positioning them where we want to get the information. If they're just static, as they are in many mammals, then you have to move the head. Uh, it's interesting, seals, when they're exploring objects, have <coughs> static whiskers and they do little head movements in order to get uh, something possibly a bit like the signals that rats get. By moving the whiskers, you can sample a larger volume of space with a given number of whiskers. And you can, we've shown that you can tune that so you can sample in front of you for something interesting there. Or you might want to sample in big sweeps if you're interested in what's around you. Or you can tilt your head down towards the floor or up to the ceiling. So I've argued that you can control the velocity with which the whiskers contact the surface. And that you might want to contact with a particular velocity to help you discriminate things. And also you can control the frequency and the duration of the contacts, which might also be useful for discrimination. We've done some recent work comparing rats and mice. Actually, they whisk in quite different ways, and that's in our new paper, and I can tell you about that if you're interested later. Why do this for robots? Well, uh, I think I've, hopefully I've, I've persuaded you that, that when we uh, build robots, we ask different questions. The, robots, uh, the, the robot engineers force us to answer the question, do the whiskers sweep across the floor or not? They also ask the question, do we need strong motors so that we can drive whiskers hard into surfaces, or will weak ones suffice? Our answer was, well, weak ones would probably do, because generally the rat is not pushing the whiskers hard into objects. Uh, we've, we've, using the robots, we found that uh, orienting looks easy, but actually you have this problem of false contacts, and you need something quite sophisticated, a model of the cerebellum, something that can predict sensory noise in order to deal with that. So it turned out to be harder than it looked. Uh, texture discrimination, you might think, is quite a hard problem, but actually there are many ways of solving the texture discrimination, some better than others, but to build a classifier for texture is not too difficult. And we've done experiments that can't be done in animals. So, for instance, we've turned on and off the feedback control of the whisker movement, and we don't even know where that feedback control circuit would be in the animal. Even if we did know where it was, by turning it off, by lesioning it, we'd have many knock-on effects on the rest of the system, which would be really hard to understand. So we can do very precise experiments in the robot model. OK, I'm going to skip this conclusion slide and just very quickly show you some things we're doing now. So this is a rat moving up uh, uh, a pathway. So we've trained it to run up this alley. And you can see we've got a view from above of the whiskers and uh, here and a view from the side. And we're interested in how contacts with the object affect the foot placement. So we're looking at the relationship between whisking and locomotion. Is it, is it a place that people come out of it? That is, yeah. And what we have here is a, the camera is now on a dolly, and we have a tracking system so we can follow the rat as he's moving. And this is how we can get these long sequences of whisking. So right now we're just looking at the relationship between familiarity with the alley and whisker movements and locomotion speed. But the next thing is we want to look at uh, what happens when there are uh, objects on the floor and how that affects this movement. We've got data on floor mass. I might show you some videos later, showing that they really use their whiskers when they're walking along a tree. Uh, and really use their whiskers to explore the tree. This is our latest robot, Shrewbot. Um, so you can see it's, a, it's, a, it's an evolution of Scratchbot. It's got the same kind of flexible neck. We've now got uh, control over individual whiskers, and we've changed the morphology of the whisker array to make it much more like the rat, and that has consequences for the kinds of information it can detect. There's a paper coming out about Shrewbot in, in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. We're also doing work now on iCub robots on active control, active touch for hands. What we're going to do with Shrewbot is uh, model the behavior of this creature, the Etruscan shrew, uh, this is the Etrus an animal which is tiny, it's the, the smallest terrestrial mammal and it hunts uh, crickets which are almost as big as, as it. Uh, here you can see this is filmed, this is from Michael Brett's group, a film recorded in the dark using infrared and the task is made very easy because the crickets can't escape. But in the wild it would have a much tougher problem. So our goal is to assemble all of these models that we've built in Scratchbot and earlier robots we have now models of the transduction systems, 
the brainstem systems, the midbrain systems, and the cortical systems, are all very partial models, all at different levels of evaluation and completion, but nevertheless, we have functional hypotheses for each of these levels. We're building them into a complete system that will allow Shrewbot to chase this little Lego robot around on the floor and use tactile signals to track. Uh, we haven't decided yet what's going to constitute the cat. Uh, probably not biting its head off. But it's, uh, okay, thank you very much. But uh, wait, this is an interesting concept because they don't know what's up. So then it would be just more than just detecting where the water is. It has to do also with just the orientation with respect to gravity. Well, I think I mean, yeah. oh, there's not a lot of research on this. There's just one paper that, uh -huh. that demonstrated uh, this finding. So, I think so do they have problems with balance beams if you cut it half the whiskers? Mm -hmm. No, but we, we, we're just running this experiment this summer. We have a rat running on a balance beam. And we haven't yet cut off the whiskers. Um, but we've blown wind in various directions at the rat, and they seem to have no problem, but what we think the compound is their tail, because they wrap their tail around the side of the okay. balance beam. Maybe underwater they can't use their tail for balance, so they'd have to mm -hmm. rely on their whiskers, so it might be to You tape up their tail and see what happens. We'd have angry rats. <laughs> <laughs> yes, for sure. All right, more questions? Please. Uh, you have seen that in the rats, the oscillating frequency of the whiskers is about in the thick band. And. Uh, it's about what, sorry? It, it's, about, it's about in the theta band, here about yeah. The, yeah, 5 to 15. It was, yeah, it's generally around 8 to 10 hertz. But yeah, yeah. 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 But mm, also, your models and your robots have got a five as the preferred frequency of oscillation of the artificial uh, whiskers. Yeah. Yeah. Just uh, uh, you just tuned your models to the frequency. They generally were more solid than rats to uh, about 4 hertz typically. So I think, um, I don't think there's any strong <coughs> hypothesis yet as to, as to why rats would vary the frequency of whisking, but you can imagine that the more rapidly you could whisk, the more yeah. samples you could get. So, yeah. so there may be some limit to how quickly you can do your whisking. And data that I didn't have time to show, but was really interesting that we've collected suggests that uh, mice, uh, some people have said that they whisk twice as fast as rats. So rats typically whisk 8 to 10 hertz. Uh, mice have been recorded whisking 20 hertz. Now, uh, we've analyzed uh, a lot of videos of mouse whisking. And what we find if we fit sinusoids to the whisking is that they have a base frequency actually at 10 hertz. But uh, interspersed between the base frequency whisks, there can be a second harmonic. So basically they're using that signal uh, to, to generate a second pulse. And so you get sometimes a big whisk and then a small whisk, big whisk, small whisk. And you can get different mixes of the first and second harmonic. So that you can get what appears to be 20 hertz whisking. But we think it's better explained as 10 hertz whisking with uh, intermixed with a pulse at, at this harmonic pre at the second harmonic. And actually and data from the Axar group shows mice going from 10 hertz whisking to, to these richer whisking patterns and then back to 10 hertz. And this actually goes back to some data from Moneski with hamsters showing that they were doing what some people call double pump. 
but a double pump may actually be a mixing of a base frequency and a second harmonic. All right. Other questions? So, um, extending the comparative a bit, a bit further, if we look at uh, animals like crayfish and American lobsters, they have a single whisker, yeah. they call it an antenna, and they can antennae objects yeah. in their environment. And watching the videos that you showed, and watching the video of that rat, I was surprised at actually how seemingly impoverished the activity of whisking is compared to what we see uh, a lobster mm -hmm. uh, doing. Um, and it, it, there's a lot of interesting questions there. If right. you take a lobster or a, um, this is probably because the rat's doing massive amounts of parallel processing and getting a lot more information. And it's doing it very fast as well, so yeah. I don't know what the sound can work with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot of information flowing in yeah. terms of the movement, physical movement of the antenna. Yeah. So if you take a, a, a crayfish or a lobster that's familiar uh, with its environment and you introduce a new object to the environment, it'll come up and it will, it will palpate it, you know, yeah. antennae. It a lot. Um, what do what do the animals that you have do in terms of the use of these sensors? Mm -hmm. Do you have any information on that when they encounter a novel object? Well, and Mitra will talk about this a bit more. I think so it's a lot of well, some interesting work has been done now on exploring <coughs> objects, uh, a lot by Mitra's group and uh, some by Rudakatar's group. So yeah, typically they were palpated for uh, uh, five to ten different sweeps and exploring, and then they'll make head movements and explore from another position. And uh, I think one, one, while they're exploring, they're controlling their whiskers to maximize the number of contacts. So our general hypothesis is that trying to maximize contact while minimizing impingement or trying to minimize the amount of bending on the whiskers so you touch them lightly, but in as many places as possible. That's, that would be our hypothesis. And so there's probably quite a lot of memory involved here if you're going to be building up a yeah. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Um, how, how about vision? I mean, okay, that's don't see that well, but yeah. do you know any information between vision and uh, whiskering? So, yeah, I mean, we haven't looked at this, but it's interesting to think about uh, how you combine the different sensory systems. I mean, the, in our rats that are genetically blind, the be whisking behaviour looks almost identical to the rats which aren't blind. We haven't quantified it, but I would say that it may be that the, that the blind rats do more palpating of objects than ones that are sighted, which would be interesting to do that experiment. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you want to talk about superior Well, yeah, so the place, one of the places where this information converges in is in the colliculus, which I showed before. It looks as though the, the colliculus is configured by the visual system, and then the, the touch system is overlaid on that and the different uh, sensory modalities in cortex converge on collectors. There may also be some multi-sensory integration in, in the cortex, but not much is known about that. His comment about the lobster antenna is very interesting because lobsters use their antenna a lot for flow sensing. <coughs> but I'm wondering what a rat does when it gets in a stiff breeze. Well, I mean, flow sensing has been explored in, in pinnipeds and seals, yeah. and it's been demonstrated conclusively that they can track fish using their whiskers, yeah. beautiful data from um, so, Mitra, you've looked at some flow sensing in We have some data on that. It's very preliminary. Um, seals have whiskers with undulations along them. Yeah. And that seems to have the consequence that they don't vortex shed in them as well. So the, the vortices cancel each other. Mm -hmm. Rats have a circular cross section that just tapers. And what happens, as far as we can tell, independent of the way that the whisker is oriented to the flow, is that the whisker vibrates at its resonance, which depends primarily on its length. Mm -hmm. And so that's the primary effect that we see. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not yet entirely sure what to make of that. You know, possibly with different lengths, with different lengths of whiskers, you can infer something about flow properties. And we have not yet done the experiment of altering velocity so far. We only tried one velocity, two orientations, our next step is to different velocities. Yeah. Well, I was just wondering, in the case of the rat, it seemed like the, the breeze would be very disruptive to its normal tactile sensing. And there's a the worst case noise situation. Yeah, and that might be something you'd want to be able to compensate for. And again, you might want to use your calliculus, possibly. I'm not making it. Like sorry, I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So everything Tony doesn't know happens in the collective. No, no, no. Oh, 
cerebellum. Uh, yeah. 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 cerebellum. So yeah. on the I have a question on the general question regarding your motivation. You say the third one is doing experiments that would be hard yeah. to do before. And I'm not convinced how is this useful for the neurobiologist because you would use experiments to have predictions and then confirm this in experiment with, uh, with animals. So this might be useful for the robot in the new, but for neuroscience, is it really useful to do yeah, experiments? Ab absolutely, because uh, uh, when you use do an experiment in an animal, uh, you're generally really constrained in the circumstances into your experiment. Most experiments in your biology are done in animals that are anesthetized or in slice or that are restrained in some way or that you know they're just in a lab environment. So that, that, that every time you do an animal experiment, you're doing a model of what you think the natural animal would be doing. So we're, we're just doing models, but we're building physical models or we're building a complete model. But unlike the animal model, we have full access to all the workings of our model. So we can really explore how it works because we built it and we understand it. Now, if somebody's doing a model using a anesthetized rat as a model of that rat, uh, there are many limitations on what they can do to the animal, for instance, what they can record. But also, there's a lot of things we don't know about the difference that an anesthetic makes to the brain. And it could be having a huge effect, and in fact, it's known to have a big effect, for instance, on bowel cortex. Yeah, so Elon was hoping you would say, oh, yes, you're right, that's completely useless. In <laughs> 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 if, if, if I can comment on that, one of, one of the biggest problems in the neural office is even in the systems where you have the most exquisite technical access, to be able to record from the most important neurons is often impossible. They're often five to ten microns in diameter, you can't get an electrode in them. We know nothing about them. If we can model them in a robot, we can get some sense of what they're actually doing. And, and in fact, that's my motivation for doing robotics. Totally. At, at the end of the day, one day you will have to confirm this with the... With the yeah, but the modeling... Well, that's... The modeling is just pretty informative. I don't model it. Yeah. You can <laughs> still explore the search space pretty efficiently this way, right? right. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is a bit more. So, so, so yeah. Yeah. I mean, sometimes I've seen that in, uh, people say, you said the idea of the robots to say, well, we're going to avoid doing experiments with animals, I mean, like, uh, like this. We, don't, we, don't, mm -hmm. we will not need them anymore, but... And that's not a claim, I think. No. Mm -hmm. I'd, like to, I'd like to add that some, something else that I think is really important. The brain <coughs> is built from many, many parts that have phylogenetic histories. And if you look across animals, you can see this part is larger in this species or smaller in this species. This, this connection is present. The one thing, one major area that's, I think, the future for biomimetic robotics is to explore the evolutionary roads not traveled and figure out why the animal has the brain that it does. And so I think this is a huge dimension that we can be thinking about. Right, so the brain must like explore all the brains that don't exist from now on. <laughs> that's what you said. But constrained by the phylogeny. Right. So yeah. at some point in the past, our human ancestors diverged you know, and maybe the humans are a little too complicated, yeah. we're better dealing with arthropods. Mm -hmm. What was the advantage of making that direction to have exactly. yeah. a, a commissural connection, right? Sure. Uh, and you can explore the evolutionary road, not travel. Yeah, that, that's another thing which is on, uh, I have a fuller list of the reasons why to do robots. Uh, can I make a final comment? No, you got them started now. So, uh, <laughs> 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 so let, me, let me just uh, uh, final comment. I so, hope you brought lunch. So, uh, Norbert Wiener, who was one of the pioneers of cyber, cyber cybernetics, he wrote that um, the best model of a cat is another cat, or preferably the same cat. Now, people misinterpret, completely misinterpret what he meant there, as uh, saying uh, you can't do better than a cat as a model of a cat. A model of a cat. What he really meant was that um, there is no good model of a cat. What you actually should do is use models which you know are bad models, but are easier models to investigate. And that's why he was saying that the ideal thing to understand cats is to study freely moving cats doing their thing. We can't do that. We have to study them tied down, anesthetized, chopped up into bits. Th those are one kind of model. Another kind of model is a physical model like a robot, where they really can move around and express a whole range of behaviors. And we can study them because we know how we built them and we, re we can record everything that happens. So I think they're fantastic physical models, and I think that's what Norbert Wiener is trying to do. Mm -hmm. Other questions? 
Then I have a question for you, Tony. Oh, God. Uh, but but <laughs> first, you, you seem to have started the wrong animal. That's not a cat. <laughs> but this is the so trust look, You have this model that you have. You, you say like, okay, here we have sort of uh, some piece of cortex, and then I have some whiskers. Yeah. And, and they sort of uh, activate these different points. Yeah, yeah. And then you have sort of these spreading waves. Yeah. Through this cortical sheet, and they superimpose. So you might have sort of some additional hotspots now where you get activity, and that's what I can read out because it tells me I'm sort of triangulating between yeah, these yeah. spots, right? Yeah, yeah. So, but an alternative approach would be that you just look at the temporal properties of this, right? So you, you just have a, a wave of activity going through this map, and you could also say, look, I'm just summing all this activity, I just spatially average this, right? Yeah. So I read it on, and so I get some, some population response over time. So this is time, and this will be this as the amplitude of the population response. And this is my encoding of the sensory signal. So have you, have you considered this as an alternative? Because now you talk about mapping time to space, yeah. creating all sorts of new problems. Why not just take your time? Have well, you, so, you so, you're th you're th so you're throwing away the spatial information yeah. here in the encoding. Forget space. Well, yeah, I mean, y you can use that, and you can use that, for instance, to recognize texture. Now, have you done this? Have you looked at this? Have you compared these two encoding models? Um, not for looking at, so we're interested in, in extracting uh, velocity, direction, and shape from the mm -hmm. signal, not in it. So you can get texture from a single whisker, <coughs> and texture's been pretty thoroughly explored by looking at these kinds of properties. No, where you, you, might want to start, you, might, you might want to say, oh, this is an edge, this is a corner, or something like this. Yeah. Right, so, so if you consider, because for visual processing, this has turned out to be extremely powerful and very, very compact, a very compact way to encode yeah. complex information. That might be an interesting comparison to what you're proposing here. Yeah, also I agree, yeah. It's yeah. exploiting exactly these wave phenomena in a more direct way. Uh, yeah. If I can make a comment, I mean, as we will look at that in the future, because the, the approach on the left, you've got that essentially what Stuart Wilson is working yeah. on, there's the approach on the right, is what I'm working on, mm -hmm. Charles is working on. Mm -hmm. But you already have some... But we, we've got no common comparison. We've got no robots which we've tried both mm -hmm. type techniques on. Okay, well, and you can just take this data itself, right? First, we have applied this to the olfactory bulb or the antenna lobe yeah. of the moth, and we just have given the optical response of the antenna lobe, mm. used both a spatial interpretation or a temporal interpretation, and then shown, and then just then looked at what kind of, uh, what kind of classification, what's the classification performance of these two encodings of the sensor yeah. signal, right? So you could do something similar for the whisker system. But you can't get direction out of this purely temporal code if you throw away. How, how do you get direction? Because it would be the same. You, you throw away space, then it's the same way from this way. You might no, no, you don't know that. You might have some modulation of these responses. Maybe this guy is blinking at a somewhat different frequency than this guy, depending on direction. You don't know that they have your eye. I think you could do right. direction as well, because you could look at the correlation between different whiskers as well. Yeah, but that, that's bringing the space back. No, but wait, Tony, in, the, the, in yeah. this case, you, you exploit all temporal modulation. Yeah. So that would just imply that. If there's something, if there's some difference here in the say, reflection, yeah. that this is translated in the response latencies of these neurons, yeah. or a response frequencies, I think right? it, and it, that will translate in that. I think in some some way I mean, you're bringing space back into it. You're certainly bringing the topography of the array back into it if you want to encode direction. Yeah, but you get it. Yeah, obviously, you're saying you're saying it's encoded implicitly in well, the Well, at the pairwise level, this translates yeah. in the very specific phase differences, but phase relations between the the single neurons in your map. But look, we can, yeah, yeah. I don't know. And it, it, I mean, end, I, I think, I'm, I'm not disagreeing, I think we should do this. I, I understand yeah, your concern, sorry. but in the end, yeah. it's all decoded in the curriculum, so it's, it's all right. <laughs> 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 all right, so, uh, yeah. <laughs> so thank you very much, uh, Tony, it was a great talk. So,